Uh, we're going to let our kids go back to the children's ministry area. Looks like that may all be um, So Lisa and Diana are back there, and they will guide the kids back. So that's great. And that transition from playing drums to, to preaching, it takes a second. It's a little off. Sets you a little off. All right. Well, hey, I want to thank you for being here today. Um, one of the things you notice is that there are a few folks that are missing and gone today. Um, one of the uh, uh, things stepping into this week, we had a few folks that ended up sick this week. Um, a couple of them are on vacation, and it snowed this morning. So, you know, it's this perfect uh, convergence of a lot of events. Um, but this is the reality. Do we need a room full of people to worship God? No. You know what? I was listening to you guys sing and worship, and it was dead on. You know what? God, his heart was pleased, and, and I truly believe that, that our worship is something that is pleasing to him, and, uh, and I believe he's pleased this morning. So um, we're going to jump into our passage here. We're going to be in 1 Peter chapter 4, and we're going to be reading verses 12 through 19. And uh, I gave my thing a test run this morning and it doesn't appear to be working again so give me a minute as we go through this uh first peter we're working our way through the book of first peter and here's one of the things that we believe about scripture is that it is god breathed it is inspired by god and everything that we do as a church in understanding god needs to come from the word of god because the bible is how god has chosen to reveal himself to us. So if we want to know who God is, we have to look at how he revealed himself and how do we know how he revealed himself in this world? Through the Bible. And so everything that we do as a church is, is going to revolve around how do we manage the word of God. So what we've done over the last couple of months, and we've done this through a number of books of the Bible, is reading through the book of First Peter. And as we go through this, we are going to be reading every verse, every um, of the book of First Peter. Um, and, and we're going to go through, it's been a, a rewarding time. Would you agree? Yeah. I've enjoyed it. I, uh, as I stepped through it, I was like, I don't know if this is going to work or not. And, uh, cause this one was a bit of a challenge and we've covered some challenging topics and subjects and it, you know, I think that God has been glorified. So I want to set the tone for the book of first Peter, because we're getting toward the end of first Peter. And today what we have is this summary statement of, of what Peter has said all the way through. And what we see in 1 Peter, as it started out, he is saying that this is a church that has had some, some persecution, some suffering, and some difficulty. It doesn't go into depth of what that suffering and difficulty was, just that they were going through some hard times. Now, does it matter that we know what they were going through? Not really, because we all understand hard times. And he was saying, you know what, this is for the refinement of your faith. And we're going to talk about that in a little bit today. And as he was going through that, he starts to define who they are in Christ. He says that you were bought with a price. You are born again. You are his special creation. And, and you are not of this world. You are a stranger or an alien to this world because you are of another kingdom. Now, that doesn't literally mean we're aliens, right? Like outer space aliens. I was expecting a little bit of feedback. The fact you're hesitating is really concerning. Um, so what he's saying is we are not of this world. We ought not live like we are of this world. And he goes on then to say, if Jesus Christ is your Lord, this is what it looks like not to live of this world. You have to abstain from sinful desires and live good lives among a lost and dying world. And he goes through and he starts to list all of these areas and how we live and dying world. And then he starts to address some of these specific issues of how do we deal with suffering. And today, what we're going to talk about is our struggle with struggles. I was so creative on the title this week. Our struggle with struggles. I was proud of it. And, uh, so we're going to read it's going to Peter chapter 4 verses 12 through 19. And it doesn't look like my slides are working. It, well, they're working up there, but not right here. And I'm going to have so that's okay. All righty. Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. 
But rejoice inasmuch as you participate in the sufferings of Christ, so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed, for the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. But if you suffer, it shouldn't should be as a murderer or thief or any other kind of criminal, or even as a meddler. However, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. For it is time for judgment to begin with God's household. And if it begins with us, what will the end be to those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if it is hard for the righteous to be saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? Those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do good. Let's pray. God, we thank you for today. We thank you for this opportunity to be joined together as your body. I pray as we go through our day, as we listen to your word today, that this would be eye-opening and heart-impacting. Your word always always speaks to us. May we be receptive to hear. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, this chapter, this book starts out, I'm giving this thing one more try. It doesn't look like it's working. So you got me, and that's it. And hopefully it tuned in to where I am. I think we'll do fine. All right. So in this passage in first Peter chapter four, verse 10 says, dear friends, and it starts off. And, and I love that Peter is, is writing this not as an authority. Now, does he have authority? Absolutely. God is overseeing this. He is overseeing this book that's as a fellow traveler, as someone else who is suffering and struggling in the difficulties of life He's saying, dear Friends, This is written from a context of relationship. He says, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. I absolutely love this passage. I love this passage. Um, who's ever had a hard time in their life? Like any kind of hardship. If you're not raising your hand, you need to be up here preaching. Um, <laughs> That's reality. That being said, I want you to go in your mind to those hard places, those hard times, those fiery ordeals that you have gone through in your life. And I want to ask you the question, did you feel surprised? And as I think back on it, it's like, I guess I kind of did. You know what I mean? It's like, I understand why these things I didn't see this one coming and here I am in this hardship in this difficulty ah, it's just not right it's just not fair and and we have this like going on within us that we we don't think this is fair we don't think this is right but we are, and we have this element of surprise in our life and and what Peter is saying here is, is that God allows us to go through these fiery ordeals for the testing of faith and, and in 1 Peter chapter 1 and 7, it says, In all this you greatly rejoice, for a little while you've had to suffer grief of all ki- and all kinds of trials. In your life here. Okay? In context of eternity, is our life here just a little while? He says, you've had all these. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, hardships, Develop and refine our faith for the glory of God. Now, I want to be transparent with you today and tell you how I go through fiery ordeal. Okay? Because this is like really humiliating. If you relate to it, awesome. If you don't relate to it because you're a good Christian, then you can ignore this part. But when I go through fiery ordeals, I like to practice what I preach. And the first thing I do is go to God in prayer. Except it's not this noble prayer. It's not this, you know, may you be glorified prayer. God, I'm going through a fiery ordeal. Get me out of it. I don't want to be in a fiery ordeal. And God, I want to be this happy, comfortable life 
where nothing ever goes wrong, and I never have bills come in the mail, and I always have enough money, and I'm never sick. I want that life. And if I go through fiery ordeals, I'm like, God, you've got to get these ordeals out of my life because I if, if you fire me after this, it's probably justified. Blame. I look at this, I start to point my finger at who they were, how sinful they were for what they were doing. And here I am, this innocent, righteous, upholding the law kind of a person, and I'm suffering because of other people's stupidity. Right? And in doing so, I build myself up in my own righteousness, and I build them up in their own stupidity or their own sinfulness, and now I am completely justified with anything I say and anything I do because from the foundation of I'm right anybody else am I just me or is that kind of we share the weight okay then because because I'm righteous and because those other people are obviously wrong I can start to take action I can take action because I'm justified in taking action because I'm right and rather than what I'm going through and understanding that this is a refining process, I fight actively to get myself out. And lastly, I get super me focused because I look at this refining process and say, this is going to end in me being stronger. This is going to end in me this, me that. When we look at First Peter, what does it say? That our refining is for my glory or for his and in the end, I look at it, and as I endure it, and as I go through it, I start to say, look what I did. Look how I endured. Look what I did to get out of my problems. Let me share wisdom with you, and who is getting the glory in my little self-centered process of dealing with fiery ordeals? And I might throw God in there a little bit, but ultimately, it was handled by me, for me, and I get all the glory. And God is just up there shaking his head like, trying to refine you bud and you keep jumping out of the pot not getting refined you, you know what I'm saying and what Peter says is don't be surprised when you go through fiery ordeals they're going to come this life is a short life and it's hard and the reality is that we often well, but we try and take heaven which is where we're headed if Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. And we look at verses about heaven like there's no more sickness, no more death, no more tears, no more suffering. All the old things are gone and all things are good and new according to the will of God. And I'm like, and I'm going to try and grab heaven and drag it down here and try to live with it right here because I want heaven now. And the reality is, this isn't heaven. I don't know if anybody looked out the window this morning, but this isn't heaven. I love the snow. I hate driving in the snow. This isn't heaven. You turn on the news. You're reminded. This isn't heaven. Heaven is where we're headed. And if we try and drag heaven here, we are going to be so sadly disappointed. In this life. See, God gives us that description of heaven so we can turn our eyes to that in hope. So we can endure this life now. In fact, I think he paints us this picture. And I might have used this, this story before. But let's just say, and I, I don't play the Powerball. Like, you know, but let's just say I won the Powerball. I had my ticket. I'm watching TV. And all the numbers line up. And I've got like... $500 million, and it's going to be a check that's mailed to me on Friday. And a bill that is $75 overcharged on my power bill. And the kids left the heater or something. You know what I'm talking about. Am I at that $75 overcharge when I know that I got $500 million coming Friday? I don't even care. You know why? Because on Friday, I'm not going to worry about any of this stuff. In this life, God has said, I have a place for you. I have heaven for you. You have for a little while a time to endure. But I want you to know 
Eyes are set on what you have waiting for you. It gives you the strength and the ability to be refined and endure in this time. We ought not be surprised at these things. Number one, because it's not heaven. And number two, because God, and he's going to refine us. He has a home for us. So I want you to know that our place today, I'm really excited about. Can you tell? <laughs> All right. We're going to cover some really good stuff. But you shouldn't be surprised at the fiery ordeals. They're to be expected. They really are. He continues in verse 13. But rejoice. Rejoice in what? Fiery ordeals. Rejoice inasmuch as you participate in the sufferings of Christ. So you may be overjoyed when his glory is being revealed. You know, I want to continue reading that first, uh, first Peter chapter 1 passage. It says, First Peter chapter 1 verse 7. Talking about the trials. These have come so the proven genuineness of your faith. Of greater worth than gold. Which perishes even though refined by fire. May result in praise, honor, glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. But it continues. It says, though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him. Filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. He's saying when we go through difficulties, we ought to have an inexpressible joy. We are experiencing the salvation of our souls. So when we go through struggles, inexpressible struggles, difficult struggles, struggles bring us to our knees. The reality is refining our faith. And I don't want to use faith as this generic term. Just to have to have faith. You know, like the song says. You know, No, faith, faith in what? Just having faith isn't enough. It is the object on which our faith is placed that will either have our hope grounded or just be left with empty hands. That faith is focused on Jesus Christ. That he is in control. That he did die on the cross for my sin. That this process is Going through a refinement where I focus on him and I take joy knowing that Jesus is in this process refining me. And I am growing to have this joy because he gets the glory in it all. And this is the mindset that Peter wants us to see. Is that by our suffering, we become less dependent and less trusting on the things of this world and more dependent and more trusting on him. It's only through the hardest times of my life that I realized just how much I depended on myself. And when you cannot uphold yourself anymore, you find out who Jesus really is. You find out you can trust him. You find out that he's there. These are things we never experience until we start to be blind. He continues. And in 14 and 15, we've kind of preached through this. So I'm just going to not gloss over it, but we're going to get there. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you're blessed. For the spirit of glory and God rests on you. But if you suffer, it should not be as a murderer or thief or any kind of criminal or even as a meddler. So if you suffer for being a murderer or a meddler, you know, those kind of like ends of the spectrum, right? Like killing people and just getting into people's business. Either way, if you're suffering for something stupid you did, you kind of had that one coming, right? But if you suffer for doing what is right... It says that you're blessed. Now, I don't want to dive into this really deep because we spent like two weeks covering this as we went through chapter three. And if you missed chapter three, I encourage you, it's on online, you can go check that out. But the bottom line is, suffering for doing right is Christ-like. Suffering for doing wrong is just consequences for doing wrong things, right? You're not blessed, you're not noble, you're not refining because of doing things wrong. 
is for doing things right that we become aligned with Christ. So in verse 16, we're going to continue. However, if you suffer as a Christian, be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. Now, there's one word in this that stands out, and it should, it probably doesn't stand out like right away. But that word Christian, it shows up three times in the entire Bible. I don't know if you realize that. We, we throw the word Christian around a lot. And it's only used three times in the whole Bible, the word Christian. And it says, if you suffer as a Christian, don't be ashamed, but praise God, you bear So the first time the word Christian shows up, and I want to go into this definition of what the word Christian means and how it was used. It showed up in Acts chapter 11 in talking about Barnabas and Saul, who later, later turned into a guy named Paul, who wrote most of the New Testament, but not Peter. That First and second Peter was written. Don't want you to be confused. Then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. For a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. One big thing I want you to see. It says the disciples were called Christians. Did the disciples call themselves Christians? No, they were called Who they look like. They look like Christ. They're acting like Christ. They're talking like Christ. Therefore, we'll just call them Christians. And, and we actually have a comparative in our world today. If I'm from Washington, I'm a Washingtonian, right? If I'm from Idaho, I'm a Idahoan. If I'm a Californian, I'm an unwelcome guest. No, um, um, I'm just joking. But... Um, We love everybody and even like making fun of people. Um, no, so, but the thing is, if we look at Californians, they have like this, they're all a certain way in our mind, right? And it's because, you know, you like label people and you like associate definitions to labels and that's just what we do. And when these people saw these disciples in Antioch, they said, all of you guys are acting the same way. You all act weird. You all act talk different. You all do different things. You're like that Christ guy. He was walking around saying the same stuff, doing the same stuff. We're going to call you Christians. We're not going to call you disciples of the way. That's what they were called before. Now they're called Christians because they looked like a guy named Christ. Now, we walk around calling ourselves Christians. We walk around, and I've seen, like, I remember when, when Lisa and I were very first married, there was this mechanic that we went to because her car was broken down, and he had a little fish on his sign, right? And, and he called himself a Christian, and we went and got her car fixed. And it costed, like, three times as much as it should have, and her car still didn't work. And we're like, well, that's not very Christian. He called himself Christian. But would I go paint a fish on that guy's sign? No. I want you to think about the word Christian in this way. It's not something I call myself. It's something another person ought to look at me and identify. It ought to be seen from the outside, not proclaimed from the inside. Does that make sense? Because if I look like Jesus, should that be seen in the world around me? Yeah, and what's been like the whole point of this whole book is look like Jesus. Think like Jesus. Look, abstain from sinful desires. Jesus abstained from sinful desires. Live such good lives among the pagans. They may see your good deeds. They may accuse you of doing wrong, but they will glorify God. Is that what Jesus did? Yes, in every scenario, he did this. And when these people started living in this way, everybody around started saying, Christians, you're looking like Jesus. So in 1 Peter 4, it says here, if you suffer as a Christian, 
What does that mean? For looking like Jesus. We have to understand, when the Bible says Christian, it's not talking world religion. When the Bible says Christian, it's talking about someone that looks like Jesus. If you suffer for looking like Jesus, do not be ashamed. Why should we not be ashamed? We praise God because we bear the name of Christ. I don't know if we understand the weight of what it means when we step out into the world as a follower of Jesus. Everything we do, everything we say, ultimately goes back not to us, but to that name. I carry it with me everywhere I go, whether I like it or not. Every action I do, every word that I say is boiled down to, does it look like Christ by the world around me? So we ought to be grateful that we carry his name. We're going to continue in verse 17 because Peter makes this transition of going from suffering and difficulties and challenges and fiery ordeals in our life and suffering for the name of Christ because we look like Christ into this topic of judgment. Judgment. That doesn't sound like fun, right? And my slide stopped working, so we're going to have to... This is frustrating. I'm going to figure this out. So in judgment, it says in verse 17, it is time for judgment to begin with who? God's household. And if it begins with us, what will the outcome be for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if it is hard for the righteous to be saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? And he just kind of asks that and leaves that hanging. He says, judgment starts with the house of God. And, and the first thing I want to talk about is this, this tone that Peter carries all the way through the book. Because as you see, all the way through the book of 1 Peter, he's been saying, we ought to live good lives, live good lives, live good lives. This is what we ought to do. This is who you are called to be. And there's a reason that he does this. Do you know, want to know the reason? I have condensed like six or seven verses in 1 Peter down into back to back to back to back. So, so we can see this. 1 Peter 1, 5. It says, the salvation that is ready to be revealed and what? The last time. What's the next verse? 1, 7, I think. May result in praise, glory, and honor when what? Jesus Christ is revealed. Will he be revealed? Soon, yes. Uh, 113. When Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming, what does it say? Jesus is? He's coming back. Okay. Uh, chapter 4, verse 5. We talked about this one two weeks ago, I think. They will have to give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. What is yet to come? Judgment. Then last week we hit this verse, verse uh, 7. The end of all things is near. Today, we're looking at this verse in 417. It says, it is time for judgment to begin with God's household. Next week, chapter 5, verse 1. We're going to see next week. Share in the glory to be revealed. Is it still coming? Yes. And then in chapter 5, verse 4. When the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. Why? Is he giving us all of these looks to the future? He's saying, I know you're going through a hard time right now. I know you're going through suffering right now and struggles right now. But what you need to know is you just have a little bit of time to endure. Because Jesus is coming back. His glory will be seen. Judgment is coming. He is coming to us as a friend saying, you need to know that the time is short. And if there's one thing that these last couple of weeks have shown all of us, is if Jesus returns or our be heart beats the last time, our time is short. It is. And we're going to get into some of this as we get into 2 Peter and, 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 and what Jesus is doing, like why he's waiting, why he's patient. Uh, and we're going to talk about that. If you want to skip ahead, read 2 Peter. You'll get it. And um, extra credit for you. That will never be seen by anybody. But the whole point is this. 
The time is short. And if the time is short, it's so we can get in the game now. We don't get sidetracked by some of the difficult things to get sidetracked by, and that is difficult and hard circumstances that seem on us. There's nothing that will derail us like a hard day. You guys know that. You came home after a hard day, you're grumpy, and the last thing you look like is Jesus, right? That's reality for me. And he says that judgment is going to begin with God's household. Going back to 1 Peter chapter 2, he defines that. He, 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 it's interesting as we go through this, he defines all of these terms and all these phrases for us. He says that as we come to him, he is the living stone. This is Jesus, rejected by humans and chosen by God and precious to him. You also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. He says we are being built together. We are his body. And what he's saying is those of us who have been saved by grace, those of us who call Jesus Christ our Lord, those of us from the outside when the world looks at us says, Christian, we are a holy nation. We are a priesthood together. And this is where judgment will begin. And I think sometimes we look at it and say, well, I'm a Christian, therefore I'm exempt from judgment. It's not true. In fact, this is something that we need to be aware of. Jesus taught this and taught this and taught this. And I want to read an extended passage from Matthew chapter 25. And, and this is a story that Jesus told. It says, when the Son of Man comes in his glory. Has that been the language that Peter's using so far in this book? The coming glory, Jesus is returning and all of this stuff. Is it stuff we've talked about? Yes. And all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him. And he will separate the people one from another. As a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, come to me. Or come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance. The kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. The righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you as a stranger and invite you in, or needing clothing and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go visit you? The king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not look after me. They also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison and did not help you? He will say, truly I tell you, whatever you did not do for the least of these, you did not do for me. Then they will go away to eternal punishment, and the righteous to eternal life. Do you think Peter is saying this for a reason? There is reality. And we don't know if it's tomorrow, today, five years, ten years, or a hundred years. We don't know. But is Peter doing the right thing by telling us to get ready? Absolutely. And I look at this and and what did Jesus say would be the separating factor? And it's very similar to what, what Peter says the separating factor is in, in verse 17. It says, the time for judgment begins with God's household. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel? What is the bottom line? Is it obedience to the gospel or rejection of the gospel? And I think that oftentimes we, we struggle with this. I, I want to read... 
the passage we read last week. It says, the end of all things is near, therefore be alert and sober of sober mind, so that you may, be, that you may pray. Above all, love each other deeply, because love covers over a multitude of sin. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others, and as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. You see, I think oftentimes we get this and we hear this story of, of Jesus died on the cross for our sin. It is by grace you are saved through faith. And that is truth. That is Jesus Christ is our Savior. He died on the cross for our sin. But oftentimes what we forget is the rest of that verse that goes on to say in verse 10. It says, for we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works which he prepared in advance for us to do. Here's the thing. Every action we take, every word we say is a broadcast or a declaration of our faith. I think people try and separate faith and works like they're incompatible. But faith without works is dead. That's what James says. If you are a new creation, you live in a new way. If you have a new heart within you, you begin to feel and live in a different way. And what Peter is saying, what Jesus is saying, is these people, they want to honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They've missed the point. Our lives must experience the change that comes from looking like Jesus, following Jesus, and pursuing him with absolutely everything in our life. Because that's the only thing that matters. I want to be clear. Salvation is by grace through faith. But there is a miracle of rebirth within us. And spiritually alive people look different than spiritually dead people. And what he's saying here is if you do not have faith in me, it will be obvious because you will know a tree by its fruit. The actions that follow tell where the heart is rooted. I want to look at judgment. I want to look at struggles and hardship from God's perspective. You know, in 1 Peter 1, it talks about refining gold, right? And that hardships are like this refining process that we go through and it refines our faith. And we talk about this with such absolute and concrete terms. But I want to talk about gold. If I have a big... fire, why do I have a confidence in doing this with this gold? Am I going to ruin gold? No. We all know the qualities of gold. It's going to melt. It's going to turn to like all the bad stuff is going to go to the wipe out the bad stuff and the gold becomes more pure. I know one thing. When I put gold in the fire, is it going to Christ within us, and he puts hard trials in front of us, what is that going to do to our faith? Is it going to kill our faith? No. It will refine it. It might look different. It might have a bunch of stuff that was removed from it. It might come out completely different. Faith. Because faith is rooted in himself. And he will always be faithful. We must understand with struggles that these are preparation because we are going to see God face to face. We will face him in judgment and we have to endure these hardships and not just endure them but allow them to refine and change our lives so we can be Christ-like so one day we stand before him as a good and faithful servant. Fed the hungry and clothed the needy. It isn't feeding the hungry and clothing the needy that saves us. It's to change and become Christ-like. Well, this passage ends with this. So then, the chapter. So I think we got two, two weeks left, maybe in 1 Peter. And guess where we're going after 1 Peter? Yay, 2 Peter. Okay. Um, 
So really, this is like the conclusion of this whole teaching part of chapters 1 through 4. So then, those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do good. But doing good brings what? Suffering. So commit yourself to your faithful creator and just continue. Refine. Don't run away from it. Don't hide from it. Don't be shy about it. But understand, we ought not be surprised. This is what it looks like. Jesus suffered. And we're following him. So what does that mean for us? We're going to suffer. So don't be surprised. And as a body, what we do is we encourage one another in these things. And one family that I want to just highlight as we conclude, and they're not here today. I don't think they're here. Is Bill and Jonah Maycumber. I don't know if you guys know them, and they don't know. Oh, hey, Bill. How you doing? You're hiding up there. Bill's had, would you say you've had a rough couple months? Yes, sir. Um, would you call them fiery ordeals? More or less, yes. Um, watching Bill go through this has been, uh, it's been a hardship. But one thing that's never changed, I know, is his faith. His faith in Jesus Christ as he has endured these things. And not just endured trying to get out, but just allowed himself to be refined. And it's a beautiful thing when the body of Christ that is being built together on the foundation of the cornerstone, Jesus Christ, recognizes that one of the bricks is having a tough time. People have reached out to them and touched them. And I know our prayer group prays for them every week and all kinds of stuff. And to see Christ actually look like the body of Christ is something that I just want to celebrate and say, praise God. I, I'm not going to take all the time and go, hey, Bill, give him a phone call. Say, how you doing? He'll tell you a story that's hard to believe. Of what God has done in taking a broken life and begun bringing it to this path of being healed. We talked about Laren. We, I mean, there's amazing things God is doing in this body. And I just want to celebrate that because we have a good God. And one of the things about enduring suffering is it easier to do when you're with somebody. Yeah. We're here for each other. Thanks, Bill. We're going to close with this. And, and what I'm going to ask is that we're going to take those communion cups. And what I'm going to do is just have, take a moment of silence. And, and what communion represents really is just a highlight of what we're talking about today. So what I'm going to have you do is just bow your head, close your eyes. If you miss communion stuff, it's out there on the table. You can go pick one of those up and... Um, but we're going to have a time of directed prayer. So if you'd bow your head and close your eyes, if God was speaking to you at all through this passage today, what you need to do is just respond to him. It's this wonderful big picture of how we endure this stuff. And it's not just endure, but allow our hearts and our lives to be changed. If we come out the other side looking different, looking Christ-like, that's a good thing. But we'll never look more Christ-like unless we go through the refining fire. So this morning, I'm just going to ask you to bow your head. Each week, we take assessment of our own lives. We take stock and say, where am I? Am I following Jesus? Am I falling short? No, I, I think sometimes we sit here and say, I wish God would speak clearly to me. And I often say it this way, it's usually he's saying stuff we don't want to hear. He's saying you need to clean something up out of your life. You need to forgive someone. You need to, you know, do something that you don't like. And you're like, you know, and, and we have this back and forth with God. What I'm going to ask you to do today is surrender. If he says to do it, you do it. If he says to stop doing it, stop doing it. This is a process of change called repentance. It's a step down this road 
big church word, sanctification. It is him refining us to look more like him for his glory, not ours. So if there's sin in your life, take the time and confess it to him right now. week we take time to pray for the lost who do you know that you know jesus take the time to pray for them today if there's one thing and if you don't know jesus um, that was laid out to you today you aren't guaranteed tomorrow separation from jesus is eternity in hell that's not an outcome anybody wants it's glorified by the world but that's because that's a deception. Hell is not a good place. And we see in scripture that even Satan and his demons do not want to go to hell. And neither do you. And the only way, the only path is a narrow path through Jesus Christ. He died on the cross to pay the penalty for our sins so we can have righteousness defining our life before God on judgment day. We must take faith, place our faith in Jesus Christ that when he died on the cross, he died for our sin. Accept the payment for that penalty. Acknowledge that you're a sinner. And recognize that he now defines us. He becomes our savior, but also our Lord because we are now alive in him. And we pursue him. It's a free gift of salvation, but it will literally cost you every day of the rest of your life. Don't do it flippantly. Count the cost. But take up the cross and follow him. Let's take a moment and pray for the lost. Next, we're going to pray for the hurting. There are those that I know are going through times and times of loss, times of grief, times of sickness. Let's take a moment and pray for the hurting. give thanks give thanks to him for who he is for what he's done give thanks because all of this old garbage is going to be gone and he's going to make everything new let's give thanks to him in the last supper Jesus is a picture of his suffering for a sinful life, took the bread and he broke it and said, this is my body. It'll be broken for you. Take and eat in remembrance of me. Let's do that together. The same way he took the cup and said, this is the cup of the new covenant. It's my blood poured out for the forgiveness of your sin. Take it and drink. Paul goes on to say that every time we eat the bread and drink the cup, we proclaim the Lord's death. Morning, in this opportunity to be here and worship you, you're a good God. I thank you for your word. And I pray that we would take your word to heart. You can stand and sing with us if you like, or stay seated.